Nehemiah chapter 10. Now from uh, chapter 9 verse 38 we read, And because of all this we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests sealed unto it. Now those that were sealed, the continuation from chapter 9, remember the chapter numbers are not uh, what Nehemiah written. The chapter numbers and verses came much later on. So sometimes the thought between the chapters is in the previous chapter. Nehemiah, the Tarshida, which is the governor, the son of Hakaniah and Zechariah, Zechariah, Shariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pasher, Amariah, Mount Kaijah, Hittish, Shebaniah, Malak, Aram, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginezon, Baruch. Now that's not the Daniel, a book of Daniel. Mishalom, Abijah, and Majum, Mazariah, Bilgael, Shemaniah, these were the priests. So you know that Baruch in verse 6 was not the Baruch of Daniel because he wasn't a priest. And the Levites. And now Levites, both Jeshua, the son of Azaniah, Benaniah, of the sons of Hinnadad, Kadamiel, and their brethren, Shebaniah, Pozajiah, Keliah, Penaliah, Hennan, Michael, Rehob, Heshabiah, Zechariah, Shebaniah, Shebaniah, Hoijah, Benai, Benuai, the chief of the people. All right, now the chief of the people. Parash, Paramoab, knows how that Moab keeps showing up. Elam, Zaktu, Benai. I mean, they may have forgotten, you know, how to speak the Jewish language we see in Ezra and Nehemiah, but they sure remember the Moabites. Uh, verse 16, Anajiah, Bigviah, Aden, Atar, Hezekiah, Azur, Hojiah, Hashum, Bizei, Harfaf, Ananath, Ananath, Nebiah, Magmish, Meshalom, Hezer, Meshazikbio, Zadok, Jaduiah, Pethaliah, Hanan, Ananath, Hosea, Hananiah, Hashbub, Halash, Pilha, Shubik, Ramim, Hashabiah, Messiah, and Ajiah, Hannah, Anna, Melech, Haram, and Bana. Now, if you go through that list three or four or five times, you're going to get the different pronunciation of those words. I guarantee you won't get it right. And the rest of the people. The priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanins, all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God. Alright, they got rid from they got rid of they got away from Babylon, they got away from the Arabians, they got away from everybody they're not supposed to be. That's what the Christians are supposed to do. They're supposed to get away from all those that don't want to serve Jesus. Anybody who doesn't want to serve Jesus, they're not part of the group, they're not part of the people. And you ought not have fellowship with them. It's not pleasing God. They're not pleasing God. They clave to their brethren. Oh, wait a minute. No, I didn't finish. 28. Their wives. So the wives went along with the husbands. Their sons and their daughters. The children followed. Everyone having knowledge and having understanding. Knowledge and understanding comes from separation. You, see, you look at some Christians out there and say, well, why... Why do they do what they do? Why do they live the way they do? Because they're living amongst the world. They have never taken a stand for Jesus Christ. You say, well, they walk half. No, you don't walk half. Either yea or nay, Jesus said. Either you serve God or you serve Satan. Either you walk hot or you walk cold. Lukewarm makes God sick. There's no half. They clave to their brethren, Jews, their nobles, and this is from the list that we read, and entered into a curse. 
enter into a curse. Well, what's all that about? How do you enter into a curse? And into an oath. That and there doesn't mean there's a curse and there's an oath. That and means an inclusion to, an addition. So this curse is a reference to an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God. The curse here is, is listen, we don't do what God t tells us to do by the law of God written by Moses. Cursed be the person that doesn't do what they're supposed to be doing. That's what the curse is. What they're telling God is, we're going to make a pact. We're going to make a covenant with you. And Lord, anybody who doesn't follow what we're going to do, they're cursed. Not by you, God, which it is, but by us. They're going to be an outcast. How different Israel is today. Listen, from the book of Acts to today, if a Jewish person, male or female, believes the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they have become alienated from their family. Why did the Jews sell all their possessions in the book of Acts? And why don't we do that today? Why don't we follow that practice? Because when a Jew became saved and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they lost their job, they lost their house, they lost everything in the land. And they needed help from the church and from the brethren. Because now that they got to pack up and they got to go somewhere else. they got to establish themselves other than in the land because the Jews will have nothing to do with it. This is all through the life of Jesus Christ. There were was, was secret disciples. There were secret men. And feared the Jews. Nicodemus was one of those men. You lost not only you know your respect, your status. Listen, you lost your job, you lost your money, and you lost probably your family. So you know what's amazing thing that you see in the book of Acts? Haven't you come to the conclusion that something is said in the book of Acts is it's really weird? And it says, this person got saved in their family. Or their house. Wow. The entire household trusted Jesus Christ no matter what the Jews were going to do. You can't even get a saved Christian today to do what God wants them to do. In a country of freedom that we have today. So, separation, curse, and deserve and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his judgments and his, and his statutes. That's what they were supposed to do. That's why they were in Babylon, because they did not do what they were supposed to do. Babylon changed them. So when you come up and say, well, punishing your children has no effect. Capital punishment upon a criminal has no effect. They're lying. You haven't put, it, well, very rarely do you put someone to death for their crimes in America today. And you, as a result of not doing that, you've got a house full and still feet sticking out of the prison windows of full correctional buildings. And they go out of those correction buildings ten times as worse as they went in. Some even go back just to have a place to stay and food in their stomach. The American correction system does not work. There was a time when mama and daddy especially would spank the little darling when they do, when they do wrong. And the, the biggest problem you had in the schools back then is chewing gum and running in the hallways. Now you got to run in the hallways to run from the guy who has the gun. But TV's not wrong and video games are not wrong. But most of your video games and all that, shoot them up. And then the media, oh, why do all these people get shot? You've been putting it on the television, you've been, all the movies, you've been putting in the video games. So the families are involved. And today that's a reverse. 
You're being cursed for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it's a curse. I have been told by one Jewish guy, and I've heard it from another and a few others, one personally, that it's, they have a mock funeral for the, for the person. They actually hold a funeral service for my friend who was a Jew who got saved. You don't ever call mama back. You don't ever call dad back. You don't call your brothers. You don't call your sisters. You are alienated by them. So here's a good curse. Curse that, listen, if you don't do right, Maybe we had that a little bit more today. You're not going to live right as a Christian. We're not going to have you in the church. We're not going to have you in fellowship. Oh, that's what Paul said about the guy who was not living right in the Corinthian church. Turn him over to the devil. Not today in America. Just go down to another church if you got sins. Many people with sins will walk into another church and they'll receive them happily. And verse number thirty, I believe, and they and, and that and that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. No intermarriage. They've already been messed up. And there's one either Ezra or Nehemiah, one of these two books that the children couldn't even speak Hebrew. You know what America is today? We can't even speak English. We don't even speak the King James 1611 English. And because of that, it's become, you know, these obsolete words. I'm, I'm for that we should learn the words in the Bible and use them. None of this BBFF or... You know, OMG, that, that's, that's garbage and that's wicked. And you will stand before God. Remember, you got to give an account for your mouth. If I can ever remember that place in Matthew, I know it's in Matthew. Don't tell me. Some people just don't want to listen. They want to do their own little thing. Well, you suffer before Jesus Christ and don't go cry, baby, that you didn't get no reward that the smoke detectors went off. I'm telling you in these videos, I'm telling you. You're going to stand before judgment for what your mouth and what you do for actions. You don't want to listen? I try to. And if the people of the land bring where? Now, that's where you think of hardware, Tupperware, goods. And any victuals, food. And this food in the Bible you would see was also victuals for, for camels. and I mean, any kind of food for human or for animal consumption. On the Sabbath day to sell. That we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath. So all these people in the land, they come to Jerusalem. Now the city walls are now up. They come on the Sabbath day to sell their stuff. The people are saying, we're not going to buy it on the Sabbath day. We're not going to do nothing on the Sabbath day. I believe Ezra had a problem with that, or Nehemiah. One of these two guys, they had a problem with the people coming in the, into the land, and they were selling their stuff on the Sabbath day. And the Bible says, rest, and Nehemiah is like, <clears throat> excuse me, people, isn't this why we went to Babylon? Because you were working on the Sabbath? That God said the land is going to get its Sabbath rest? You're going to Babylon. You're going out of the land to the to the land gets its rest that you haven't given it. The people are learning. And that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Now that would probably be the Jubilee. Oh, they know what the Bible says. They know what the law says. And that's maybe the Jubilee. Also, we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly for the third part of a shekel for the, house, for the service of the house of our God. Right? This is a man-made law. That every year, a third part of a shekel, we're going to give for the house of God. 
Why would that be? All the times they remember the house has been taken down, the house was destroyed, the house needed repair. Keep that temple upright. Keep it going, unlike their history through First and Second Kings. For the showbread, all right, money's for the showbread. That's the uh, twelve loaves of bread that were to be put out on the table every every morning or weekly morning. I forget it was every morning or for a weekly. And for the continual meat offering. And for the continued burn offering, that would be with the lamb in the morning and the lamb at night. For the Sabbath, for the new moon, for the set feast, and for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel. That would be probably the day of atonement. And for all the work of the house of our God, what they're saying is, we're going to give an extra amount of money every year to make sure that the supplies of the house of the Lord are there to be done. And we cast the lots. Look at that. This is found in Joshua 9, 1923. Just one of the examples in the Bible. It is found when they uh, chose lots. I believe it's Acts chapter 1 or 2. It's drawing straws, shooting dice, picking a colored ball, whatever it is. Today you would call it gambling. But it's not gambling. It is something that it is a a chance. I don't want to say game, but it's something that where only God can do and show what He wants. What you would do, for example, is you would have five straws, one straw being shorter than the other straws, and you would pray over it. You know, there's people that pray for their lawyer. They say, oh, Lord, let me win a million dollars. God, don't listen to those prayers. Now, when you got a group of men, and listen, this can be done today in the church age. When you got something serious in your life, very, very serious, you got a choice of men in the church that you don't know who to choose. You got something in your life that, listen, you got a crossroads, and listen, you prayed about it, you prayed about it, and you're unsure. And you go to this thing, you say, Lord, whether I get the short straw, whether I get the blue marble, or I get the number five, whatever, however you choose to cast lots, you are relying on God, and there's no two out of three. Now, I have never done this. There's another thing of casting lots, and I'm not going to say it's wrong. I have never done it myself. I've done it a couple times, and... It does not work for me. It's, it's where you pray, then you open up your Bible, and you put your fingers somewhere in the Bible, and then that verse or some verses around there, God is, I, I've done that a couple times, but maybe I wasn't serious enough because I didn't get a serious verse. And I've got some weird things. Well, if you're in a dire strait, you really want an answer from God, he answered you like that. Is it wrong to, to open up your Bible? That's between you and the Lord. Is it wrong to get a deck of cards and say, Lord, if I get this card out of out of 52 cards, that's between you and the Lord. I'll tell you, there are people out there who will cast lots for a living. Yeah, I know, the casino. No, I'm not talking about the casinos. I'm talking about... Uh, Contractors who have their own business and farmers. A farmer's got to lay on what kind of seed am I going to grow this year? Because you can't grow the same seed year after year after year. Because if you plant corn all the time, you lose the nutrients in that soil for corn, and again, eventually you ain't going to grow corn. You got to grow another crop the next year to put back, some plants put nutrients back into the ground that you need. And you don't know what the weather is going to be like. God does. And you got to sit before these bushels or packets or whatever you got. You got to sit before these seeds and say, Lord, I got to feed my family this year. I need money and the roof on the, whatever. Lord, there's four packets of seeds here. Which one do you want me to plant? 
and you get the Christian contract, and Lord, I really need this bid, but I can't go so low that I'm going to lose money. And Lord, I gotta pick the right men that ain't gonna do me injustice during this, or it will cost me money. Listen, you want to talk about lotteries? I'll give you lotteries of life, where you don't play 52 cards, you don't play dice, you don't spin balls or anything like that. I'll show you some things in life where it's a real gamble. And then when you get a farmer who loses it all, then what do you do? So they cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for the wood offering. To bring it to the house of our God. Look at that. They put these group of people. And this lot here is, Lord, who's going to go get the wood? <laughs> so the joke would be, this would be the holy wood. <laughs> All right. Well, they want you know, you know the problem? You, know, you know, you look at that. Well, why? You see... Oh, nobody wants to do the job. So we got to find out. No, I don't think it's that at all. I think everybody wants to do the job. I think, well, who's going to get the wood for the for the, for the the house of the Lord? And he gave like 100, maybe 1,000 people raised their hand. I, uh, well, we can't have one person bring a log each because we'll be, I think they got to choose, Lord, who, who, do you, who do you want to do? Today, when you've got something for the Lord, and you know you gotta go find it with a microscope. I could be wrong. Maybe they, maybe no one did volunteer. I think the way the people are in this, this chapter, I think a lot of people volunteered to bring it to the house of the house of our God, our God, after the houses of our fathers. So we're, somebody needs to get wood. But God for the fathers, at times appointed year by year. So this is for someone to go get wood. This is their job to get wood for the house of the Lord and for the people. To burn upon the altar of the Lord our God as is written in the law. And to bring the first fruits of our ground. Crops that are grown, carrots. I don't know if they had tomatoes. We know they had cucumbers and you know they had onions. They loved them from Egypt. Okay? First fruit of all fruit of the trees. That would be your orchards, your apples, if they had apples. I don't know, oranges. I don't know if they had oranges there. Everything that grows from a tree, figs especially. You got ground crops, you got tree crops. Year by year unto the house of the Lord. Also the firstborn of our sons. Now that they were, they were to bring a redemption. They were to bring uh, they were to bring an offering. They were not to put their children on the altar. It was an offering for the firstborn. But still the firstborn of God. And our cattle. So there's your beef. As is written in the law. And the firstlings of our herds. And of our flocks. Goats. Sheep to bring to the house of our God and to the priest that minister in the house of our God. So you just don't bring it to anybody, you bring it to the priest. But what were they doing in Jesus' time? They're walking out with the money, going to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes. Hey, I buy that land, and then, you know, bring it back to the scribe and Pharisee. Then they were making a double market on it. That should be, verse 37, that we should bring the first fruits of our dough. Well, isn't that interesting? First fruit of dough, dough came from wheat. And rye and those other grain crops. That's back in 35, first fruits of the ground. They bring their wheat or their rye to the, to the, the house of God. Then they, the wives would make dough. They take the dough and they bring the dough to the priests. And our offerings, and the fruit of all manner of trees, of wine, grapes, and oil, that would be olives, and maybe other plants that gave oil, 
unto the priests in the chambers of the house of our God. There were chambers at the temple where they were to store the goods and the needs for the Lord and for the house and for the priests. And you, what do you see today? You see these little storage places are all around. They would be around the temple. If you look at any online, look at any picture, just look up Solomon's temple and they'll show you a picture of what it was like. And they look like these little places that you, that you put your stuff in. And the tithes of our ground unto the Levites. That the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of Tillot. Now it says tithes in verse 37. And it says uh, to bring the first fruits of the ground and all that. There was a time that you brought your first fruits. Everything that was picked first. You didn't take it. That went to the temple. And then you tithe out of your crops and out of your beans after that. Now today people, do I tithe gross or I tithe with that? Listen, first fruits. Your first paycheck going to the Lord, if you're in the Old Testament, goes to the Lord. <laughs> gross or not. Then after that, tithes. You plant a garden. You go through that garden the very first time, picking all the fruits and vegetables. You bring that to the you bring that to the house of the Lord. You don't keep one. It goes to God. That was for the priests and for the offerings needed. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, the new wine, no hiccup juice. And oil unto the chambers where are the vessels of the sanctuary. And the priests and the minister and the porters and the singers. And we will not forsake the house of our God. Yeah, they don't forsake the house of God. Isn't it in the time of Jesus? Isn't it beautiful? Look at the stones. Look how great they are. And Jesus shows up. God shows up and they crucify him. Yeah, they did, they did exactly what Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 39 says. They got so fanatical about it that they crucified God. They got so fanatical about it, when you go to the book of Acts, they dragged the apostles out of, this, out of the synagogue. They dragged them out of the temple and beat them and put them before courts and put them in jail. They got so tied up in the building, they didn't see God at all. And that's where churches are today, these mega churches, million dollar churches and all that. They're so much into the wood, stone and all that, God could walk in and they wouldn't even know it. And he's not going to walk in anything like that. Because Revelation chapter 3 says he stands outside the door and not. It's amazing. And you can get into a church service, go wrapped up in soul, other stuff like that, and never know, maybe a soul got saved. You don't know. But that's where they left off. They're finally doing right. They want to do right. And we'll finish the book of Nehemiah with some troubles that come up. 